thank you so much for joining us this evening for the next instalment of our Research Network webinar series, which is part of our Staying Connected program. My name is Faye and I'm the Grants and Impact Manager at Ovarian Cancer Action. And tonight, Professor Ahmed Ahmed will be talking about his team's latest discovery, which is really exciting and has been dubbed the Oxford Classic. So the Oxford Classic is going to have impact in two important areas, early detection and improving treatments for women, in particular creating personalised treatments for a subtype of ovarian cancer um, tumours which have especially poor prognosis, where current treatments are not successful. But I'll let Armi tell you more about this in a moment. So we fund some of the work of Professor Ahmed Ahmed at the Weatherall Institute of Molecular Medicine at the University of Oxford and his work studies the molecular mechanisms that cause ovarian cancer cells to grow so that new targeted drugs can be used. And before I hand over to Ahmed, you can ask any questions via the chat box and Q&A function and he'll be able to answer these towards the end of the session after his presentation. I'll also include some of the questions that we were sent in beforehand as well, so thank you for those. Although Ahmed is a clinician as well as a researcher, we kindly ask that you do not ask any personal medical questions. However, you can ask questions that are relevant to you and your experience. So thank you Ahmed for talking about your research today. And I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Faye. Thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks for the uh, attendees for their interest in supporting ovarian cancer uh, action and ovarian cancer research. So I'm going to uh, just start sharing my screen. So uh, as Faye mentioned, I'm going to talk to you, to you today about um, uh, the Oxford Classic. I'm going to explain uh, that, uh, uh, the, the story about it so far. Um, the Classic comes from classification of carcinoma of the ovary, so we sort of gave it that name to the, so that it's easy to remember. Uh, I just thought that rather than just uh, telling you, diving in uh, what the Classic is about and what uh, we hope it does and how it would benefit patients, I thought actually to put it in context um, of the story and how we came to, uh, I, to um, make the Oxford Classic. So this really came from many years of research. I probably, we started working um, uh, in that line of research, maybe 2012, 13. Uh, but we really, um, uh, you know, started working on uh, uh, on that, and then it took us many, many years until we finally um, came to realize the Oxford Classic. So I'm going to start by uh, telling you the background, and really the background come from uh, um, a patient of mine, uh, Triple. We, we we sort of we are not allowed to say names when we. Um, yeah, when patients join uh, our research studies. So we refer to patients in numbers. This was patient 11152. Uh, this patient was a, became a very good friend of mine. And this um, part of our discussion about research and about her illness, she wrote this uh, back in 2012 and she gave it to me and in her writing, uh, she said in the spring of uh, 2012, I received the devastating diagnosis of ovarian cancer, the silent killer. Uh, why me? Why anyone? Like thousands of women before me, I searched for reasons why was trying to come to terms with the illness. And really this um, relationship with uh, my patient, Triple One Fifty Two, has really inspired a lot of the work or, in our lab. Um, and just really to tell you, unfortunately, um, this patient uh, passed away a few years back. Uh, but really her uh, work and her words has inspired us to uh, continue working in this field to improve um, outcome for women with ovarian cancer. So um, 
this uh, patient, I had the privilege of looking after her when she presented back in April 2012, and um, where she had chemotherapy, uh, followed by surgery, followed by further chemotherapy, uh, and then unfortunately she uh, then developed a recurrence back in 2014 and then uh, subsequent uh, recurrence episodes as well. But what we did was we recruited her to a study of ours that at that time was looking uh, for doing whole genome sequencing of tumor sites before chemotherapy as seen here in this photo. And then after chemotherapy, when patient completed her, um, her treatment, and then after that, when she came back with her currents, we were able to sample the disease. So we were able to sample the tumor at three time points in her uh, uh, tumor history, but not only from a single site, but from many, many uh, sites. When we ended up doing whole genome sequencing of about 40 different uh, sites uh, of disease. And I'm going to just, before really, um, talking too much jargon, I'm going to just give you a little bit of background about what we mean by whole genome sequencing. So, um, you know, our DNA uh, is really, think of, I think about it as a big dictionary of, of letters, and the letters are called nucleotides, and they are one of four, A, C, T, or G, and each cell uh, has about three, uh, billion letters and this was what makes up the dna so these three billion letters their order and the um actual type of the letter nature of the letter dictates what we call the genome of the individual the dna of the individual and um watson and craig discovered the dna double helix this sort of arrangement of the DNA in this helical structure and got a Nobel Prize for it. But then it was Fred Sanger who discovered how to read the DNA and how to read that code, how to read the dictionary, and not only the DNA but the protein code and got the Nobel Prize twice. This discovery of Fred Sanger about how to read the DNA was really, really incredible because it opened the door for a lot of uh, research um, after that in that to, to enable us to understand how tumors behave and how to classify tumors. So tumors um, are characterized by alterations in that DNA uh, in, the, in, in the entity. So you could get a C instead of a G and that is so important and so crucial uh, because it can change the behavior of how the cell uh, behaves and could make that one single mutation could be driving um, tumor start and progression and chemotherapy resistance and so on. So this discovery was really, really very important because it enabled us to read uh, that dictionary of the DNA. So the DNA, as I mentioned to you, is assembled in these nucleotides. There are four nucleotides, but there's that just this amazing characteristic about DNA that each nucleotides are, as I mentioned to you, they're like assembled in, double, in two strands, in, a, in, a, in two strands, like Watson and, uh, uh, and Craig first described. And these th two strands have this amazing complementarity essential complementarity. So A will always, always uh, pair with a T, and the G will always pair with a C. And that complementarity um, is so important to understand because we can then use it uh, for the sequencing techniques that we use, and also for developing any new methods to try to read particular codes in the genome. So that's what the DNA. The DNA then gets um, what we call transcribed. It gets a message that is where these sort of the, the, the GNA has the code of the genes and then gives the message, which we call messenger RNA, 
that is essentially um, enzymes in the, in, the, in the cells read the sequence and change the sequence to an RNA molecule, which is very similar to this, A, C, T, and G, but instead of a T, there is a uracil, so it becomes A, C, U, or G. And this makes the RNA. The RNA then is translated to protein, and the protein is, proteins are the workforce of a cell. And these proteins um, are essentially the things that will make that work in the cell and give the cells, tissue, tumors their identity and their subtype. So the abundance of certain numbers of proteins, for example, in skin cells, will be uh, very different from those uh, in the uh, bowel or um, in the eye because each tissue type has its own function. So by understanding this sequence of events, DNA, RNA, protein, subtype, one can also relate this to understanding tumors because what we also find is that the abundance of the RNA or the proteins of certain proteins in the tumor what, uh, can dictate how that tumor behaves and how it, for example, responds well to chemotherapy or resists chemotherapy. So really just wanted to give you an idea about these um, terminologies because we will be using them uh, later on in the talk to explain the Oxford class. So with reference to patient triple 152, what we found from sequencing those 42, 40 different samples was that there was a mutation in a gene called P53 or TP53 this is a famous cancer gene that was present in almost all the samples, indicating that that mutation happened really, really early on in when, when a normal cell was transforming to become cancerous. But we also discovered mutations in almost all the samples in near a gene called SOX2. And what we then went on to found was that these mutations were associated with an increase in the number of SOX2 molecules. This number of SOX2 of molecules we quite often refer to as expression. So it was associated with an increased expression of SOX2 in the fallopian tube. So if you look here at this, these pictures, so this is a fallopian tube, a section of the fallopian tube from a patient with no cancer. And SOX2 is revealed here by the brown stain. You can see just the occasional cell that has it. This is the fallopian tube, on the other hand, from a patient with ovarian cancer. And you can see how there are many, many, many cells have this uh, uh, SOX2 uh, protein expressed. Similarly, patients, um, women with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations who do not have cancer also have this uh, high level of SOX2 protein. In the tumor itself, in the cancer itself, the protein gets switched off. So it seemed to us that this SOX2 uh, somehow enabled progression from a normal uh, cell to cancer, but then got switched off in the cancer. Um, how these sort of chemotherapy resistance uh, occurred in this particular patient um, and how this uh, resulted from mutation is still really we're still trying to understand how this happens in patients like triple one fifty two and, and, and similar patients and we've really made some great progress with that but this would probably be a subject of another webinar but overall the idea is that you know when you give patients chemotherapy Unfortunately, they accumulate more alterations in the DNA molecules, and these uh, alterations or mutations, also they accumulate differences in abundance level of proteins, and this then gives the drug-resistant phenotype that we see, and that means that for these patients, unfortunately, they stop um, responding to treatment. So this is here like a, a diagram of how we think uh, uh, the cells uh, transformed from normal fallopian tube to having a SOX on 
uh, fallopian tube cell that enabled mutations to accumulate, particularly p53 mutation, and enabled cancer transformation that then spread to different sites, site A, B, and C, but then uh, particularly site C was particularly resistant to um, tumor, to chemotherapy, and this resulted in, in recurrence. But what that meant was that this clue about SOX2 meant that we really should be started to look very carefully into the fallopian tube as the source and the origin of uh, ovarian cancer. And that led us to continue working to try to understand the biology of fallopian tube cells. And this is an area of very active uh, area of research in, in our lab, really all inspired by these discoveries that we made from samples of our first patient, uh, patient 11152. And this was, this was some of the headlines from, um, uh, from uh, uh, magazines and uh, online uh, journals that um, publicized uh, our uh, work at that time back in 2016. What we didn't know, so what we knew, as I mentioned to you from this research, is that the fallopian tube is the highly likely cell of origin of ovarian cancer, but which cell type we didn't know. And we didn't know whether there are different cell types and therefore different trajectories from a normal cell to a cancer cell. And what, how tight the relationship was between the fallopian tube cell types and ovarian cancer types, and the, the process be modeled and uh, new early markers discovered. These were all questions that came from uh, this finding about of, from SOX2. So just really as a reminder of this sequence of events in any cell, a DNA gives that has that is composed of these key nucleotides giving rise to the message, which is the RNA that gives rise to pr uh, proteins. The abundance of RNA correlates very well with the abundance of proteins. Uh, of different genes, and this then gives the subtype. So the reason I'm just reminding you of this is that as follow to follow up of um, from as a follow up from that work, we wanted to better understand the tissue of origin, the fallopian tube, and for that we used single cell RNA sequencing. So RNA, as I as I explained to you, is an important type of molecule in the cell, and that the level of the RNA molecules represent the abundance of various proteins, as I explained. So what we did next was we um, used RNA sequencing, and the technique profiles all RNA molecules in a cell, like taking a, a snapshot of the different cell states. So this is very different from the traditional technique. In traditional technique, we just take a bunch of cells and get RNA uh, out of that bunch of cells, and then we do the RNA sequencing. And what you get is here like resembles a smoothie uh, because it's a mixture of different cell types, and you're trying to, uh, uh, trying to guess what the smoothie, the smoothie is made up of. While with single cell RNA sequencing, we are essentially trying to um, doing the sequencing and profiling of RNA on a cell by cell basis to identify you know, the strawberries from the blackberries from uh, the, the different um, components that made up the smoothie. And this technique is very powerful because it enables you really to subtype the cells based on their profiles, based on their abundance of particular RNA species. As I said, you know, the analogy that I gave you uh, at the beginning you know, you, 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 the hair is different from the eyes, different from the, the bowel. And what we were trying to do in, when doing single cell sequencing is to actually find out um, the hair and the bowel and the, and the skin, but all within the fallopian tube, the different subtypes of cells in the fallopian tube. So we profiled over 6,000 single cells. And this generated really a large amount of data. It's equivalent to um, uh, about eight laptops, the, the combined capacity of eight laptops put together. And it's required high power computing server, which we did to analyze the data. And this really led to the discovery of many subtypes 
of cells in the fallopian tube, which is the tissue of origin of ovarian cancer that we didn't know about before. And the finding really enabled us to understand how sophisticated the fallopian tube structure is. But then what we started to find is to say, okay, so now we understand the cell of origin. We understand the different types of cells from the, uh, from the fallopian tube, which is the tissue of origin. Can, now we, can we now link these subtypes to different cancer subtypes to try to come up with the molecular a new molecular classification of the tumor based on the normal uh, cell subtypes. And this is what we refer to as the Oxford Classic. So it's a classification system of ovarian cancer that is based on the newly discovered subtypes um, of the fallopian tube cells. And the new uh, molecular classifier, the Oxford Classic, robustly really associated with disease outcome. A particular subtype of that uh, of those uh, uh, of this classification, which we call EMT high for epithelial mesenchymal transition high, uh, was really associated with poor outcome in patients. And what we think that how this would benefit is because if you are able to accurately predict disease outcome from the beginning, from the start, you could really anticipate that if, if that the disease outcome was poor, you could really start thinking from earlier on about including patients into clinical trials in order to try to improve uh, the clinical outcome for those patients. So I am um, going to now, uh, wanted to show you a video that explains uh, this discovery of the Oxford Classic, uh, but I will hand over to Faye so that she can play it from uh, YouTube. Ovarian cancer is the sixth most common cancer in women worldwide. The use of screening to detect ovarian cancer early is key. Scientists at the University of Oxford have used a new technique to discover six types of cell that may trigger ovarian cancer. The newly discovered cells are in the fallopian tubes, which carry eggs from the ovary to the womb, and where most ovarian cancers begin. The team at the University of Oxford analysed 6,000 cells from 16 women, including healthy women and women with different cancers. They used a technique called single-cell RNA sequencing to take a snapshot of the molecules in a cell, identifying new subtypes of normal fallopian tube cells. They discovered that the molecular fingerprints of these subtypes were mirrored in individual ovarian cancers. Single-cell sequencing of the normal fallopian tube enabled identification of a particular group of ovarian cancer patients who have the poorest chance of survival and those who do not benefit from current treatments. Focusing on new treatments for this particular group of patients will be an important way to improve overall survival rates. These exciting findings take us closer to both a screening tool and personalised treatments, the two key elements we know will transform the lives of women diagnosed with ovarian cancer today and for generations to come. Really the key finding of this is that the portrait of normal cells, innocent normal cells of the fallopian tube, are mirrored into the evil cancer cells or, uh, in ovarian cancer and that by classifying normal cells, we were able to uh, make a new classification for ovarian cancer types, which we call the Oxford Classic. Then we wanted to really validate those findings um, in another new study. So to do so, we uh, collaborated with our colleagues uh, from Imperial College, Professor Christina Fotopoulou and Dr. Uh, Paula uh, Conea, in order to um, test our classifier on samples obtained from their center, from their work. And they kindly helped us by um, giving us samples from about 140 uh, ovarian cancer patients and associated clinical studies. And we used these uh, samples to uh, essentially run the Oxford Classic test on them and see if uh, the same conclusions uh, uh, hold up. 
So this is the idea of the Oxford Classic is that it's composed of this 52 gene panel. What we are trying to achieve is to measure these 52 gene, gene panel in order to classify tumors into one of these five different subtypes. I'm particularly interested in this EMT high subtype. So to do this, we constructed a, a panel a uh, new panel of, uh, of uh, probes to measure these 52 genes. I'm not going to sort of go into the details of this figure, but let me just tell you a little bit about the science behind how we measure RNA expression of, of each of these genes. Again, coming back to my key slide, DNA giving rise to RNA and protein and subtype, and what we are trying to achieve here is to measure the abundance of RNA molecules for these 52 different uh, uh, genes. So the first step what we do is that we uh, took sample by sample and obtained RNA molecule from ovarian cancer samples. And as I mentioned to you, the sequence of the RNA gives the identity of the gene. So imagine that these are, you know, Oxford classic gene one and gene two that we want to measure. Uh, the classic gene one is, has this imaginary sequence and gene two has this different sequence. And the abundance here is that gene one is low abundant while gene two has three copies. And that's what we are trying to really measure. So what we do, we use the nanostring technology for this, which is essentially what, we, what this uh, technology does is that it pairs, it provides a sequence that pairs with the sequence of, of each of the genes, but also um, has this additional uh, color code, uh, these colored barcodes that are attached to the uh, RNA sequence. And by essentially doing this complementarity and then washing away any remaining excessive barcodes, you are end up with these colored, and as you can see, each of the gene here is identified not only by the sequence, but also by the, uh, by the um, color of the barcode. And by essentially counting these uh, 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 barcodes, one can, I can get an idea of the abundance of the genes in the sample, of each of the genes in a particular sample. And so we did this, uh, we use this technology to analyze our, uh, 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 our samples. And what we found was that about 17% of all subtypes belong to what we call this EMT high uh, subtype. And that importantly, again, in this independent data set from Imperial, this EMT high subtype correlated with poor prognosis. So these patients tended to have recurrence at an early stage and unfortunately tended to die at an early stage. And this was really independent of any other indicator or what we call prognostic factor uh, that we can uh, get from looking at the samples or the, uh, or the clinical background of particular patients. So. Uh, just a reminder, we think that this, how this will help is really by accurately predicting these um, prognosis. One can start intensifying treatment, but also finding personalized treatment that suit this particularly poor prognosis subtype. It was very reassuring to see that the work was validated on this independent data set uh, in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Christina and Paula. And that really give us the um, incentive to continue working on this to do a further validation in a multi-center study. We've now approached uh, colleagues in different, uh, 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 in different um, hospitals and centers in the UK and, and outside of the UK. And we, have, we are getting great interest uh, from people to join this study where we are essentially doing further validation to confirm our findings, but also moving on from just validating this, we are also started to have uh, important con conversations with um, colleagues in pharmaceutical industry who would have potential therapeutic options for this EMT high uh, group of patients, particularly around immunotherapy, because we found that these EMT high tumors 
have very immunosuppressive environment that suppresses the effect of uh, uh, immune cells on tumors. So we think that this could potentially be a very important avenue to explore uh, therapeutic options for this group of patients. And on the basic science uh, front, really this opened our appetite to continue working uh, and researching to try to understand the, the, basic, the um, basic science and the biology of uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition in ovarian cancers. I would like to end by uh, thanking my colleagues who have contributed to this work, particularly Ziwan Wu, who was a really clever PhD student in my lab, who um, did most of the work uh, that I described to you about single cell sequencing. I thank also many of my colleagues in the lab, Christina and Paula, for their help, and my long-term collaborator, uh, Chris Yao, and many uh, others. And special thanks to uh, Varian Cancer Action for supporting our work for many years. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. So we're going to move on to some questions now. Um, so firstly, I'm going, going to ask Ahmed the questions that were sent in beforehand and then I'll move on to any live questions if you have any. Please feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A box. So firstly, um, is there a trial open for patients with a view to them joining in the Oxford Classic Studies? And if so, how does one find out the criteria for it? And can one apply through their oncologist or oncology surgeon? Um, we, the, there, isn't, there is no trial open uh, at present. But uh, as I mentioned, we, we are already planning one. And uh, hopefully there will be two components to that. One is just confirming again further uh, in more uh, uh, patients the utility of uh, the Oxford Classic in identifying this post poor prognosis uh, patient but also what we are uh, trying to achieve also is to open a clinical trial to actually that has attached therapeutic options attached to it so when we identify this group we could say okay join this clinical trial of this new agent uh, that target the EMT process. So uh, hopefully this is all in, in preparation. Great, that's great to hear. Um, another question we had for you, will this help with treatment for low-grade serous ovarian cancer? Um, the, I, it, I don't think it would, but uh, what the Oxford Classic has a component, so one of the five subtypes is low-grade, so it's very good in identifying those uh, particular tumors, but there is really no immediate uh, link that we can make to um, a particular therapeutic intervention. So it's, it helps probably more in diagnosing low-grade tumor than in actually uh, guiding therapy. Great, thank you. And then finally, does the Oxford Classic approach take into account mucinous ovarian cancer, which is in need of targeted treatments due to its rarity and lack of response to chemo? Um, it un unfortunately not, because while we really understand that the serous ovarian cancers come from the fallopian tube cells, and this is how we discovered the Oxford Classic, we are not quite sure how mucinous uh, carcinomas start and whether they start from the fallopian tube and then transform to become mucinous because uh, these mucinous cells are not present in the fallopian tube. So it's still uh, really an unanswered question in the field about how, um, how and where those mucinous uh, tumors start from. So unfortunately, the direct answer to the question is, is no, that the Oxford Classic is really only for serous, uh, serous ovarian cancers. Great, thank you, Ahmed. And are there any questions anyone would like to ask before we finish the session? Oh, we just had a question through. Um, so someone's asked, is it possible to take the test in any way, if not any idea of when it could be available? That might be a good opportunity to talk about you know what could be the timeline for this discovery what could it lead on to yes so uh so the uh, the answer is really no because it's only available at the moment uh through research and we haven't yet started the next uh, research study 
Uh, but what we are really hoping is that we're really, really working uh, hard to see how one can um, get this into a diagnostic test that then can be uh, can be requested by clinicians and surgeons uh, so that um, a patient can have a subtyping of her tumor. So this is... Um, this is an ongoing endeavor that we are really trying hard to uh, to, to 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 take forward, but uh, but not at present. Great, thank you, Ahmed. Great. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. So, thanks again to all of you for joining us this evening, and a massive thank you to Ahmed for taking the time again to present this webinar for us. I'm sure you must be so busy, so we really do appreciate your time.